This is IVP. This is The Disruptors, a podcast from Introversity Press about how faith is changing culture in unexpected ways. I'm Nancy Wang Yoon. I'm a sociologist, a pop culture expert, and a professor at Biola University. New eyes that look at the world in new ways. New eyes make contact blue, green, and gray. New eyes I realized I never knew when you realize feelings you trapped inside of you. New eyes that see the respect you earn. I am here with my very good friend, G. Present. <laughs> G, today we're going to be talking uh, and listening to uh, Terrence Lester. He is a speaker, activist, author, thought leader. He wrote this book called "When We Stand: The Power of Seeking Justice Together." And this is mm. a this is a book that you know I am reading this in preparation for the podcast, but I could not stop reading it, and I felt like he oh. was talking to me directly. I think I felt so convicted because I. Um, like maybe a lot of the listeners, you know, are want to do more to make the world a better place, but we are tired. We are uh, overwhelmed. Uh, That's and, real. I mean, it is. You know, it's the it's it's the holiday season. It's COVID. It's uh, you know months Just and life years of uh, dealing with isolation. So yeah, so it's a lot. So, but I was so inspired by his book, and I think. Um, this this interview is is going to be inspiring to a lot of listeners. Wow, that's amazing! Can't wait to listen. Yay! Terrence, let me just begin by saying that I could not put down your newest book. When we stand, the power of seeking justice together. It was kind of like the purpose-driven life book that fe- fits my ethos more. <laughs> it really like pierced my heart and made me want to be better, do better. It's like the perfect New Year's kind of book, you know, if we want to like change our lives and live a better life. Yeah, I mean, my whole goal with writing When We Stand was to really get people to think about interconnectedness,、uh, community. And、uh, justice in a way that is not overbearing and overwhelming. You know, most people, when they think about I- injustice that exists in the world, sometimes it can be like really draining、uh, because we think and ab- think about it in ways that are in silos. And when we think about injustice in silos, we start to kind of become paralyzed in many ways. And we question ourselves and and kind of wonder if I was to offer up any of my gifts and talents or myself to help to combat any type of injustice that exists, then will I really make a difference, right? And so my whole goal、uh, with when we stand was to have people think about solving problems that exist in the world in the context of community. I definitely feel that myself. So again, I feel like this. I'm the target audience here, where you know, where we're inundated with、um, news, bad news, hard news. I mean, I just found myself actually turning off NPR the other day when I was driving. <laughs> it was like some、right. sort of international news. It was so horrific, and I just thought I can't do anything about it. And if I just listen to this, it'll make me like. Completely, like you said, I I would feel completely immobilized to even like do the next task on my own personal list because it feels like <laughs>、right. I can't do anything, and the horrors are beyond human tolerance, really. You know, and it、yes. felt so bad to kind of turn it off, but it's like, oof! I just,、um, yeah, it made me feel I'm guilty and ashamed too to to not listen, right? So it's this kind of. It's a horrible cycle of like feeling overwhelmed, feeling embarrassed, feeling ashamed, and then like completely like immobilized to do nothing. Yeah, I mean that is so true.、Uh, and you add、uh, entire pandemic and the enormity amount of grief and loss that we've all、mm-hmm. experienced collectively,、yeah. uh, the collective trauma that we're all embodying, and. You know, many people haven't even fully processed what has happened over the last、mm-hmm. what twenty two plus months. It can make you feel that way,、uh, which is one of the reasons why, when I was thinking about penning、uh, the words in this book, was to also infuse、uh, this really intentional 
um, wellness uh, type of talk uh, in the beginning, uh, helping people to realize that the way that we show up in the world first starts with the way that we show up for ourselves and how we care for ourselves and how we um, are intentional about being well people as we enter into spaces of community to do hard work. Yeah, I loved how yeah you begin with talking about how we actually can um, very easily de-stress by just cutting out all of the things that we try to keep ourselves busy with, um, the kind of uh, busyness problem where um, we think that, you know, we are uh, we're actually doing things that are important or kind of going for the American dream when the American dream isn't actually what we what it pans out to be <laughs> by investing <laughs> right. so much of our time and sacrificing so much kind of like things that we we should not should be doing, but we actually want to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember um, I was really young. I was teaching in a middle school <laughs> of all places at the time. And I'll never forget as a young man, just trying to like do all of the things, you know, I was in school, had a new, new, I was newly married, had a young child. I was leading an organization within the context of the school and I was doing all of these extra things. And I started to get really uh, ill, uh, almost to the point where, you know, when I arrived at the, um, my physician, he asked me, you know, how was I managing all of those things? And I'll never forget some of the questions that he asked me, you know, caused me to reflect upon all of the things that I was doing. That was really great. I mean, you know, good work, but it, it wasn't necessarily beneficial to me and my health. And so I started to create what I call a let go list. Right. And mm -hmm. I still even use that, uh, uh, you know, even to this day of trying to figure out as I evolve as a as a person, as a community leader. And as a, a leader, um, a co-leader in my family, you know, really taking an evaluation and assessing the things that I need to shed and let go as I create uh, the type of space to give my myself and my life uh, to things that matter most in the moment. And I normally say that, you know, whenever people are thinking about getting involved in community endeavors, it's not a matter of willingness. There are a lot of people who are willing, uh, but it's a matter of availability. And I think we have a availability problem in our country because we don't know how to manage or um, create the type of margin to contribute in some meaningful way. What is like a f some questions we can ask ourselves? Because I think that sometimes we're in the thick of everything that we don't even know what to let go. <laughs> you know, it's like everything's a priority. What are some ways to kind of uh, subtract from our lives? Normally I start with just simply asking myself, am I doing anything in my life in terms of a routine that I really don't want to do? <laughs> I know that sounds kind of uh, trite, but like sometimes we get into routines and rhythms and we find ourselves doing things that we're not even comfortable with. We're just kind of, you know, dealing with them. Um, you know, I also ask myself, am I at peace, uh, with this? Because there are times when we enter into spaces and we start projects or endeavors and I mean, you name it. And at the moment when we first started, we were really at peace, but then life happens, you know, uh, we have other responsibilities that come into our lives and we forget that maybe this thing that we were doing were, was only for a season and it's okay to move to something different or just create uh, the type of margin and just allow nothing to be there, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to ask ourselves, are we at peace at this moment? Another thing that I you know, normally ask myself is I ask my, my family, uh, which holds me accountable. And you know, some people may not have families or you may uh, have blended families or whatever. I think just having some person that would hold you accountable uh, to reflect back to you what they see in you about how um, you are responding or, you know, um, embodying uh, when they see you 
uh, operating or functioning in this particular space. And uh, I, 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 I am open to feedback. You know, sometimes I ask mm -hmm. my children, sometimes I ask my wife, sometimes I even ask people who I have created community with that I feel safe. Um, have you noticed any change in me? Uh, because sometimes we can give of ourselves to things that causes us to change and it takes us away from our, our centering. And you also write that being too busy prevents us from truly connecting with people around us, right? People in our communities, people that yes. maybe we are um, judging and othering, right? Yes. I normally say that one of the greatest enemies to empathy and compassion is distance. Mm -hmm. Distance fleshes itself out in many different ways. I mean, people are distanced because they've gated themselves in a community and uh, excluded themselves from other mm -hmm. communities that they fear. Uh, people are distant because they don't want to socialize with people that uh, are different from them or emerge from a different social location. Uh, mm -hmm. People are distant because they are simply busy. Like if you were to look at their calendars, it is so filled with uh, things that they don't have any margin or time to spend with not even their own families or own community, let alone crossing the lines uh, to mm -hmm. truly engage and immerse themselves in communities uh, that are are adored and affirmed that sometimes distance uh, creates this otherization about, you know, I never forget. I was, this reminds me of a conversation I was having. I was being interviewed and, um, the guy who was interviewing me was a white guy. And he says, you know, I want to build relationships with, you know, communities. He was mentioning communities of color and he was asking me, which is, you know, really weighty because I don't represent <laughs> all of black and <laughs> black and brown people. Right. Um, but I, I, I asked him, I said, well, tell me about your routine. And he goes on this whole tangent about coffee shops. He likes to visit what he does throughout the week, et cetera. And I said, well, when listening to you, I, I haven't heard anything that communicates that you spent time in the communities that you say that you want to be proximate to. Um, because everything that he had named was uh, pretty much familiar to him. And I challenged him to break up his rhythm and his routine and to go and spend times, not trying to go and solve anything, not trying to be a savior, but to go and spend time in a place that was owned black, by a black and brown person. And I'll never forget, he calls me back two weeks later and he says, man, man, he was, he was talking about this older gentleman he had met that he'd become friends with. And he was telling me how just being in close proximity and practicing that presence and breaking up his normal routine literally became transformational to his life uh, based upon mm -hmm. all of the things that he had learned. And what I'm communicating is simply this. Sometimes when it comes to busyness, um, it kind of we, we've got to learn how to break up our routine to create the type of margin to spend uh, our time in places that uh, we're not used to spending our time. I was convicted by this line in your book about how when we, you know, once a year go and serve like Thanksgiving meal or, you know, do the once a year service project, that's not that's actually not a benefit for the recipient, but a benefit for the server. Right. And yes. so. And so the the kind of like, oh, I want to go and and and, you know, do things for people. It's really not about the people. It's about uh, I mean, it, it, it can be like you said, if, if you actually break out of your um, routine and enter into relationships and community with folks. Yes, because it's about creating the rhythms of relationships. Right. I mean, as a nonprofit leader, I see it every year. Reminds me of a time I was. It was a few years back. I was standing up in front of a massive crowd of people who had come to volunteer. We were setting up warming stations uh, around the city to ensure that people without an address uh, wouldn't freeze during the winter. Right. Mm. And I, you know, I look over the sea of people who are there to volunteer. I know some, you know, have created a lifestyle of service. 
And I know others are on that, you know, a few times a year. But I saw all of these children out there. And I said this statement, um, which probably ruffled some feathers a little bit, but I, I communicated this idea. I said, I don't use uh, service as punishment for my children. Mm. And what I was trying to communicate was that even since my children's inception and their birth, we've always incorporated service as a core value of who we are as people, as opposed to we see our kids or we see, you know, our children acting entitled and we drag them down to a soup kitchen to reinforce them. Uh, this idea that uh, poor folks are somehow other. Right. Um, yeah. And you don't want to be like those poor folks. What I was trying to communicate was what if we started to see, you know, service and creating margin in our lives um, as a way that could be revolutionary, where we could literally live this out as a core value, as opposed to having this as some weird option that we pick up off the shelf whenever we want to feel good about ourselves. If we truly think about uh, creating that type of margin and, 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 and literally um, creating this type of space in our lives where we can live this out, I just think about the number of communities that we can infuse ourselves in, the types of relationships that could be established, and also the type of impact that we could have uh, that could literally transform the trajectory of uh, people's lives. Terrence Lester is so inspirational. He's also one of the most genuine, brilliant, and big-hearted people I've ever spoken to. I think we can all agree that Terrence is a mover and shaker when it comes to doing the work of justice. He's not just talking about it. He's out there on the streets, changing lives, meeting the needs of the community, reforming his city, and most importantly, inviting others to join him in making a difference. And you know what? His passion and authenticity really come through in his most recent book, When We Stand. I read this book in less than a day because I felt so convicted and motivated by everything Terrence wrote. I love how he quotes from sociologists as well as activists of faith like Dr. Martin Luther King and Congressman John Lewis. This book literally changed the way I want to live my life. So start the new year by making a difference wherever you are. Order your copy of When We Stand Today at ivypress.com. And while you're at it, you can check out Terrence's other book, I See You, How Love Opens Our Eyes to Invisible People. And as a listener of the Disruptors podcast, you get 30% off, plus free U.S. shipping when you use the promo code DISRUPT. Don't wait. Visit ivypress.com today. I feel so convicted by all of this because I feel like I have... I have done that in my life where I, not to take my children to to punish them, but to kind of say, like, look how privileged you are compared to them, right? Um, mm. It's like, again, centered on our experience. I mean, of course, the the... The, the intent, original intent was, okay, let's go serve. But there is this kind of like the moral framing of it was, you know, right. recognize your own privilege, but not necessarily recognize your own privilege so that you can um, then use that to help others. But just just recognize your privilege. Right. right. Which, you know, a, a part of that is really healthy because, I mean, we want our children to grow up and, and realize the things that they have access to. But we want to do it in a way where we're teaching them to steward it to That's extend right. tables, right? Yeah. And not build higher walls. And I hear that in your heart. And, you know, I think we've all struggled with that in, in ways. You know, sometimes I'm, I too am convicted um, because, you know, once in my life I experienced homelessness when I was a teenager, overcame that, um, had a lot of people build community with me and uh, uh, help me to see my own worth and value in the world until I was able to start to see my own historical shaping as not something that oppresses me, but as something that empowers me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got to a place where I was able to overcome a lot of the challenges. Um, but then, you know, I know some people have never been able to uh, forge some of the relationships that I've been privileged to forge or walk into some of the rooms and communicate to some of the people that I've been able to communicate with. And I'm always torn ab by that um, because <clears throat> why me? You know, I'm not special. Mm -hmm. I don't, 
you know, see myself as being uh, special. I just want to show up in a way that is honest and with humility and and serve others. Um, but it, the same thing that convicts me is also the same thing that empowers me to continue to go out and advocate uh, to steward my privilege in a way where I'm not trying to be a voice for the voiceless, but I'm stewarding my privilege in a way where I'm passing the microphone. Right. Uh Um, You know, in my earlier years as a a leader, I used to always be like, I'm a voice for the voiceless until I realized doing this work um, that everyone has a voice. Right. (laughs) Some voices are silenced while others are heard. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I wake up every day now, my goal is to create a world where no one is invisible and to pass the microphone. And I think we need more people who are daring and bold enough uh, to steward their privilege in a way where they are passing the microphone. I love that. And and I also love in your book how you mentioned that to do what comes natural for you, right? To kind of... Um, yes. As, as a way that's easier to think, rather than thinking, okay, let's do something that is... It's kind of like the, the punishment thing that you said about kids. Like, let's do something that is so hard and so <laughs> like outside of our comfort zone, because that's what service has to be, rather than let's do something natural. Like you said, like you've experienced homelessness. You want to um, extend um, your compassion, your, your lived experience as a way to serve those who are homeless. And um, and do it in a way that's more authentic, right? Because you understand that experience a bit. And so, you know, what can we each of us think about? You know, what is our what are what have been our struggles? And if we have none, you know, what are we drawn to? What are what what breaks our hearts more? In order to kind of see that restored, right? See that that brokenness restored. Um, oh, that's so powerful, Nancy. Like you said it. Um, I think. Society has propped up, you know, certain, you know, gifts and talents and made others who may have other talents feel as other and like they have to become something different uh, to be effective Mm -hmm. uh, when that's not the case. I mean, like your natural wiring, if you're listening to this, is already enough. Um, What you bring to the table is enough. I'll never forget, um, we had a, a guy who was, um, you know, really gifted in, in carpentry because his background was construction, et cetera. And I'll never forget, we had this idea to transform this as an organization. I'm talking about the organization uh, to transform this this bus into a, a mobile makeover unit and. Um, uh, it was going to be a, a mobile barber shop, a clothing closet, a sanitation uh, space, um, which would set itself up as a conduit for people who were unable to like make it to a restroom to, you know, groom themselves in a, a sink or to a shelter that may be miles away uh, and also serve as a connector or a connection point to help people uh, get connected to resources that could help them on their journey. And I didn't know how to, you know, retrofit a, a bus, but I'd never forget. I was standing in a group of, of, uh, we call, uh, people, who, you know, serve alongside us doers. And I was talking about this idea and this guy just is lighting up. And then he steps forward and he says, that's me. That's me. I could, I could, I could help with that. You know, long mm-hmm. story short, uh, you know, our friend Dave ended up leading this whole project and even teaching, you know, hundreds of volunteers of how to, to do these very nuanced tasks that Tate uh, took skilled professionals to do and retrofitted this bus um, within the first few months of it being up and running we had uh, done, you know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mobile makeovers. But here's the story that I want to get to, Nancy. There was a guy named Jamil who came to volunteer on this bus. He was cutting hair. He was 27 at the time. And, you know, I asked him, I said, why, why are you contributing your time? And he says, well, my, my father is experiencing homelessness and I'm hoping one day I would run into him. I haven't talked to him in 10 years. Um, oh, wow. Three months later, we ran into Jamil's father. Uh, He was able to make over his own father. 
And not only that, his father got himself into a program and has been stable and on his own for almost uh, four years. And that took wow. just one carpenter or one person, uh, you know, seeing the, their themselves as being a contributor in a way that was natural for them uh, to create this ripple effect that uh, literally created life change. And, and what I'm saying is whatever you have, own it. Uh, and offer it in some way. What a reunion. What what was that reunion like? Was it emotional? I mean, that, that's amazing. It was so emotional. Like I, I'll never forget. I, I couldn't even stay on the boat bus because I was watching them interact. And, you know, his father had, didn't know that he had graduated from high school. His father didn't know that he had gone mm-hmm. to a barbering institute and he had become a barber uh, his father hadn't seen him or his younger brother. They were both there and they just kind of embraced. And I'll never mm-hmm. forget his father getting off the bus and, and coming up to me and just like giving me this big hug and was like, you're the reason that I was I was able to, you know, meet my kids again. And mm-hmm. I was <clears throat> I didn't know how to take that because, I, I you know, it was just like man, I I just wanted to show up and serve in a, in a very unique way because my gifts is, you know, ideation and, and being able to organize people around creative projects. Um, and I just wanted to offer that up, but seeing them reunite and hug and embrace and literally shed tears was just like, it was something that I, is inexplainable and they are still connected to this day. That's just that's such a wonderful story, and like you said, all these volunteers just using their gifts, right? And for Jamil, obviously, yeah. it was even deeper than that, using his gift, and also had um, uh, a desire that he wasn't sure, right, was going to be fulfilled, and then and then and then God made it happen yes. <laughs> to be reunited and to and to be and beyond that, you said, you know, having his father be restored and and housed right after. Yes, um, that's just. I mean, that's like one of those stories that you <laughs> that, that you <laughs> want to tell, right? That you want to share and and shout from the mountaintops. Um, and right. and hopefully experience as well. And I, yeah, I just reading this book, I was like, I want, I want to do this. I want to be this, you know. And and I do, you know, I already do some some justice work in my life, but I feel like, oh, I've been feeling actually the last during COVID, especially that I want to do things that are more on the ground that are helping like the most marginal, you know. So yeah. so like, how do how do we do that? How does like maybe someone like me who is already justice minded who who feels called uh, what what are some steps that we, i mean like for me i feel like yes maybe the church but but i think you mentioned even just even simple like something like volunteer match so even going on the internet and looking for groups yeah uh, you know i always ask people to you know firstly just kind of look at their plate and ask themselves a very important question, you know, what, what needs to be removed off of my plate so I can have the type of margin where this isn't like a one-off thing, where this could be something that I have continuous, you know, you know, time to give myself to. And when I talk about time, I'm not talking about like going somewhere and spending eight hours. It could be 30 minutes a week or an hour every other week. But you think about that in the context of just say a thousand people were were given an hour of time, you know, every other week that that compounded um, collective impact can make a, you know, a huge difference. And then I, I, I start to, you know, have people think about what upsets them, you know, what 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 makes you mad? And if we were to use mad as an acronym, uh, most oftentimes the things that make you mad is an area that you are called to make a difference in, make a difference. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and from, and from those, you know, from that data that you gather, uh, whether it be houselessness, sex trafficking, you know, it could be something that relates to the political process and in, in terms of, you know, voter registration and, or it could be an issue in your community, uh, you know, related to food deserts or food insecurity. I mean, whatever it is that wakes you up in the morning and you go, that irks my nerve. Uh, That uh, gives you some sense of 
uh, data to use and what you should research, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That next step is research. Research what's around you, uh, because most likely uh, there are things around you that are already in motion um, mm -hmm. that you could easily take the next step uh, to get plugged into. And, you know, even if you don't jump head first into it, um, do as they do around the pool sometimes, you know, put your foot in, right? <laughs> and and, and kind of test the water. And I, I try to encourage people just to go through that process so they can identify something and get active. Um, and as you're active, you know, you learn what you like and what you don't like, you know, uh, activity within itself gives us a lot of data uh, to not only be introspective and explore what we're good at and what we're able to contribute, but also um, it gives us a clear direction to find that thing that has our unique fitting. And it's really important that you point out in your book about our lack of connection and community that a lot of times we don't do stuff. We don't do anything because we're disconnected and we're lonely. Yeah. Um, justice work itself is just tiring. <laughs> you know, it's it's weighty. It's messy. It's confusing. It's um, never ending. It's mm -hmm. overwhelming. You said earlier you had to turn off NPR. I mean, we have a technological device called a smartphone that we can pick up and have access to injustices all around the world at one time. So, I mean, yes. you think about the compounded weight of just having that accessibility in the information age. It's, it's just overwhelming. And what community does is, is give you that type of support system, uh, strength, uh, surrounds you around like-minded people, uh, lets you know that you're not alone in the collective fight uh, and resistance against injustice. Um, it also can be a safe space, right, uh, for you to share your vulnerabilities and mm -hmm. some of your ideas and confusions about what's mm -hmm. happening in the world. Um, it, it's almost like, I, I remember one time, uh, my car battery had died, right? Uh, and uh, the cold weather, like right just a couple weeks ago, um, just took out my battery, right? Uh, and because I have a relationship with my neighbor, I was simply able to call and have them come right over. And I was able to jump my battery off and my car crunk, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that just shows you the power of how much life can be transferred through uh, community, right? Mm. And I use this analogy because there are many people right now who probably feel like their life's battery is dead, right? Or um, yeah. how they feel is, is kind of dead. And what I'm communicating is that community, um, when you are drained, right? And you don't mm -hmm. have any starting amps, right? Or, or enough starting amps. That type of community can uh, really infuse life back into you and help to uphold your arms. And, um, you know, you get a chance to just show up in the world and make a difference in the context of people you love and adore. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like so utopic, but I mean, we also live in a very... Um, polarized society right where yeah like if i walk down my street like there are um maybe paraphernalia <laughs> like being displayed that i may or may not agree <laughs> with <laughs> right right and right. and so you kind of you know you, you i think there's a there's a lot of like broken trust i think in our society right yes. now and i think I, I a lot of people you know i i live on twitter and i feel like a lot of people um, I mean, even social media can be a really horrible, harsh place. It could be a place for community, but I feel like it's a it's a reflection of of yeah, just how we are now in in living, and especially in this kind of COVID times where we're socially distancing, literally. How do we go about like you know taking that kind of leap of faith and com creating community when maybe we're we're so used to being isolated and also mistrustful? Yeah, man, that's such a good point. Uh, there is a, a lot of mistrust and uh, which is one of the ways or reasons why, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to people who have been, you know, out of touch with community. And I think sometimes we, we think about community in the 
I think you said utopic way uh, because we find ourselves comparing ourselves to what other people may have or may not have. And the powerful thing about creating community is that you get to be selective. You get the opportunity to be uh, intentional about the people that you uh, connect with. And sometimes community is not a large crowd. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> sometimes it's two or three people. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. it's one person, as my grandma would say, you'd be, you'd be lucky if you have <laughs> one, you know, one p- person that you can uh, be in community with. Uh, I think community at its core is about connectivity. It's about uh, finding people that you can be your most authentic self with. Uh, in a way that isn't dehumanizing or causing you to give up your voice and or, um, you know, your existence uh, to be accepted. You know, uh, community is not necessarily just about being invited to a table that you don't own, uh, but finding people uh, to connect with that may come to your table, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And finding people that would, that you could possibly build a table with, (laughs) Um, Mm, that's even better. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's just, I think it's about being intentional and being aware of what you feel in your body Mm. when you are talking to people. Right. Um, and sometimes we try to force things, uh, force community. Um, and I think it community is formed organically is what I'm trying to say. Well, at the same time, in your book, you also urge people to who maybe have biases, especially, you know, yes, to actually get out of that comfort zone at the same time. Right. So it's like, um, (laughs) so it's this both like how, you know, because I think that there is because the 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 lack of comfort, that's part of the problem. So how do we uh, so hard, Terrence, even talking to you, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm trying to be have boundaries, right? So I don't get hurt. But at the same time, you yes. know, how do we even build community with people who are unlike us without having to kind of be uncomfortable? Yeah. Um, I think the reality, too, is that a part of building relationships with people who aren't like us has this built in component of being uncomfortable. Um, there's no way around that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do, you know, communicate this idea that, you know, you don't have to succumb or subject yourself to any type of abuse <laughs> or <laughs> mistreatment or feeling like you have to force something. Um, but that shouldn't keep you from emerging from your bubble uh, to explore and to be intentional about. Uh, you know, creating those types of moments where you can have conversations with people who are not like you. As we um, end uh, our podcast, I ask guests, are are they reading, listening, um, consuming something that is disruptive that they could recommend to our listeners that, um, yeah, that can be helpful in some way? Well, I've read a lot. I, I currently am in a PhD program I've been reading a lot of policy. I just did a um, a policy analysis of uh, some ordinances in a city here in our country that has implement, implemented this ordinance that bans sleeping outside for our neighbors without an address. Um, and if you're mm-hmm. found sleeping outside, you can be uh, placed in jail for 30 days, which can, connects mm-hmm. homelessness to the criminal justice system or be fined uh, up to $500. And when I was, you know, doing my analysis of this particular policy, those who implemented the policy uh, excluded, uh, you know, a balanced uh, stakeholder base, uh, people who are in proximity to those who are, you know, without housing, right? Mm. And they made this decision devoid of having voices at the table, that could speak into recommendations or healthier solutions to uh, walk with people experiencing homelessness. And the reason I bring this up is because we do need to read more uh, policy and read the uh, the narratives that are being spoken uh, mm-hmm. without 
them actually being said um, because every single thing that we communicate communicates a much deeper uh, social framing uh, than we actually realize. Um, but when we read those things, whatever it, it may be, uh, we get a chance to understand those stories and equip ourselves in a way where we can do the work of social reframing. Because as George Lakoff says, reframing is a part of the fabric of social change. Gee, what did you think of that? You know, when I was talking with Terrence, yeah. I totally thought of you as someone who actually is already living in community oh. and living out, uh, you know, living out with uh, with those who are in the margins. Yeah, definitely. When Terrence was talking, I was like, I need to read his book. <laughs> like, I, I hadn't heard of it before, but I was like, wow, I need to get this because he is like full of so much wisdom, like just the whole idea of like being with your neighbors and having that organically inform your justice work it makes so much sense you know and for me and my husband we're we really chose to live that way because mostly because we're busy and we're lazy you know? <laughs> like it's hard to do justice work it's really hard to like go out of your way and do that when you need to like do your job and raise your kids and pay your taxes and all that stuff. And so we really felt like in order for us to really care about our neighbors in Los Angeles, we need to make sure that our problems are their problems and their problems are our problems. And so when I think about my kids going to our local public school and I think about, hey, I want this public school to be better. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's because I want it to be better for my kids. And I happen to be, you know, fighting for the things that my neighbors care about as well. Um, and I could I could just really organically do that kind of work. That's your life, right? You ha yeah. It has to matter to you. And so I think... That, but the rest of us who are, um, I mean, I don't live in one, but if we're in gated communities and, you know, and trying to kind of uh, protect ourselves from our neighbors, um, it's harder to do that, right? It's harder to But I appreciated to your care. questions. Yeah, because like, I feel like you were exactly addressing that tension because, you know, not my, my life doesn't make sense for everybody, you know, like that makes... But what makes sense for you? Uh, what makes sense for other people who are maybe living in other communities? And, you know, in this new year, I was wondering, what are some things that you feel like you've taken away from your conversation? Oh, as I was reading it, I like sat my family down. I'm like, we need to reprioritize. <laughs> Not in a Family punitive meeting. way. No, I was like, okay, we need to sit down and make a list of things that we care about. He said to kind of look at what pains you, right? And I wanted yeah. my family to kind of sit down and talk about like, okay, what are the things that you care about? What are the people that we really want to help? Well, let's commit to that this year. So I yeah. I was like super activated by what he said. I mean, I was angry at my family, which is probably the wrong. I was like, I was like angry at myself. I was like, we are Mom, living such ridiculously busy privileged lives. We have totally lost, you know, we've totally lost sight of what's important. Let's like, you know, let's completely turn ourselves around right now. <laughs> what are some of the things your family came up with? Oh, it was just a lecture on my part. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's we're going to be going process. on. We're going to be going on. You know, a, a short trip, and I plan to use the trip. You know, the car ride to talk yeah. about it. So, but it was Everyone just kind of like thinking time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. A time, a time where no one can like move out of the room, right? <laughs> They're yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. We just, yeah. you know, we're driving, you know, several hours. So let's sit down and just, and just talk about what matters and what can we actually do and what can we take away? Because I think uh, he talked about a kind of a, a let go list. And so maybe mm. there are things that we're doing that are taking up time that isn't useful, you know, that can be used instead to do something that really matters. Some colors let me cover pop songs in a bottle How we battle all the barriers, right? Some drink, some color their hair every night Some try to stand out, some try to act white Found music, but I've never been the stereo type New eyes break old lies New Thank you for listening to The Disruptors. The Disruptors is hosted by me, Nancy Wong Yoon. You can follow me at Nancy, W-Y-U-E-N. 
Our theme song is New Eyes by Jason Chu. Our executive producers are Helen Lee and Andrew Bronson. Produced by Richard Clark, Cray Allred, and Myla Kim.